Hello all, so this is going to be a recording of the um, of lecture nine and the purpose of this is uh, to keep us on track so we don't fall too far behind and can um, get everyone on track with uh, what we're going to be talking about next week as well. Uh, so we're going to talk about population dynamics this week. Um, we're shifting uh, a little bit into uh, we're changing the direction of where I'm going first. We're, uh, since this brings up a lot of concepts about human ecology, next week we will be talking about human populations instead of doing biodiversity first, which was the original plan. Um, but this starts with understanding how populations work together. Um, hopefully you guys have all remained safe today during the windstorm. Um, I've also been home with a stomach flu, so we're going to uh, try to get through this and hopefully, um, you know, you guys listening to this won't take you more than uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, and I'll try to keep uh, my chatting to that level as well. And, um, but there are some very important concepts you need to learn in here, particularly what goes into creating populations, because we just talked about, um, we had just talked about uh, all the different things that uh, affect um, a species in a community. Now we're going to be talking about individual populations. So population ecology is the study of how and why the number of individuals in the population changes over time. Um, the idea is that this is not how populations adapt over time. We talked about adaptation and natural selection last time, but this isn't the same thing as population genetics um, or how the alleles or how the population changes over time. It's how, what makes a population increase and what makes population increase at different rates. Um, 
how could it be that fast? The, the fastness that it was, it made it up to hundreds of millions within 60 years. And why wasn't it as fast as it could have been? Why wasn't it a uh, one trillion population within um, 20 years? So um, to think about why things happen, first, in, you know, with the starlings, you have to think about the um, how old starlings actually reach. They uh, last about five years, so obviously the, all the original po uh, population couldn't have survived to 30 years later. Um, but, you know, we have to think about what took our population, what took the population of humans so long to... Uh, get to the point that it uh, was um, that it is now. So it took almost until the Industrial Revolution, almost all of human history, starting uh, back at um, 8000 BCE, and took uh, the Agricultural Revolution made human population go up a little bit. But it took a long time until... Um, almost the Industrial Revolution, for us to just get to one billion. One, just one billion, the Industrial Revolution, which is hundreds of thousands of years of human history. Then, so nearly 10,000 years after the Agricultural Revolution, like, uh, humans have been around for a while, to hit one billion. 123 later, it... 123 years later, it hit 2 billion, not very long, to double then in size. 33 years later, it hit 3 billion. It's now at 7.26 billion, um, and that number is rising every day. So the question is, what changed around the Industrial Revolution to allow human population to continue to grow at these increasingly fast rates? And also, is there a population maximum that a planet can support? So we're going to talk a little bit about populations themselves and what limits and what um, encourages them to grow. So the number of individuals present in a single population. When I talk about a population, I'm not talking about... I'm generally... Uh, you can talk about the population of an entire species. Um, often you're talking about the population of a local species. Remember we talked about how local extinctions are common due to um, natural selection. The number of individuals in a in a location depends on uh, births and immigration. Um, so, births to that population in that ecosystem, and immigration into that specific ecosystem, and then shrink is the result of deaths and immigration. Um, immigration is movement out of that area. So, uh, think of people who are moving out of the U.S. to um, go to Canada or to Europe or wherever to live their lives instead of here in the U.S. That decreases the U.S. population and immigration increases the U.S. population um, of humans, that is. Now, immigration and immigration, that they are a little bit more complicated and uh, we want to understand if there's no more animals coming in, like is the case of the starling, uh, what affects the rate that they are increasing by? Okay, so the population's growth rate without more coming in and without ones leaving to a different region is equal to the number of individuals in the population times the difference between the birth rate and the death rate. So um, there were, uh, yesterday you had your homework, um, do and that homework was on birth rate versus uh, death rate population ecology. There is a lot of good examples in your book, and I really do uh, recommend you go look at it. It walks through the equations pretty well. I don't want you to be afraid of these equations, but it's good to see see them settled on paper because then we can relate what we see happening in actual populations of humans or, or otherwise to the actual. Um, to what's happening within this equation, okay? So, again, this is uh, R is the rate, growth rate, 
um, it's the number of individuals. So if there's a thousand individuals, if there's a um, hundred individuals, it matters because it's it, it's multiplied um, by the birth rate minus the death rate. So the difference between the birth rate per individual and the death rate per individual. Again, this is a, can I think of it as a likelihood to have a child within the next year, likelihood for you to die in the next year. Uh, generally, these are seen as annual rates of increase. If the birth rate is greater than the death rate, then R is positive. Again, this R, you multiply it um, by the number to figure out how many individuals are going to show up in the next year. If the birth rate is greater than the death rate, then R is positive. The population is growing. This makes sense. If more babies are being born than uh, people are dying, then you have an increase in population. If the death rate exceeds the birth rate, R becomes negative. The population declines, which also makes sense. If you have more people dying but not very many babies being born and you don't have any immigration or emigration to different areas, um, then your population will shrink. This is happening in a lot of the uh, smaller European countries actually right now, that, and we'll talk about that next week. Um, so again, birth greater than death, R is positive. Okay, and uh, I have some graphs later. This graph we're not going to walk through right now. Um, but when birth rate equals death rate, R is zero, so you have a steady state population, and that does happen sometimes where um, the birth rate is about what the death rate and you don't have uh, any net gain, uh, at least generally. All right. So when conditions are optimal for a species, birth rates per individual are as high as possible. Death rates per individual are as low as possible. And the R for that species reaches a maximum value called the biotic potential. So um, imagine this is something where Let's say you have a, um, a petri dish that is a clean, open area, no com competition, and you want to um, figure out what kind of bacteria were on a toilet or a shoe or something, so you're like a microbiologist would want to do this. Then they'd take that bacteria, put it into optimal growing conditions, uh, give it perfect amounts of light and perfect amounts of food, and perfect amounts um, of warmth and perfect amounts of space. No competition, no any other things affecting it except giving it absolute ability to grow as fast as it wants to. It would likely reach its biotic potential, its R max. Um, so to think about this, you want to uh, look at uh, the pop, like the full population growth equation. So. And we talked about this per capita. Well, what does per capita really mean? Um, the full population, uh, one of the population equation is that basically uh, dn over dt equals rn. So r has to do with the rate of increase. If anyone has taken calculus, you know that uh, when you're talking about rate, you're talking about the increment per person kind of thing if you average it across an entire group. Um, calculus does the same thing. It, it's able to calculate rates. So don't worry too much about the fact that it's a calculus thing. It's a derivative. Think of it this way. The term dn refers to the change in population number, okay? The incremental change in population number per year. The term dt refers to the change in time. So again, it, this could be a second, a year, five years, so whatever that's plugged into, that change in time, then uh, the change in number is going to tell you the overall rate, whatever number uh, number of population it's it's changing to. So you read it like this, and again, this is in your book, and I, I they have a very good explanation. Um, so I really do suggest you read it and walk through it. Uh, hopefully the homework helped you as well. The change in n, population number, per change in time, equals the rate of increase times the population size. Uh, so that's just the basic growth um, thing. Once you have um, the overall change in n, and that's we, you get that from the birth minus the death rate, um, per change in time, whether you're talking about the birth and death rate within a single year, within five years, et cetera, 
um, then you get the rate of increase total times the population size. As this R increases, population will grow more rapidly. So in the, in the very in, uh, quickly growing line, R is at 1, which means that um, basically the population will be doubling each year. Uh, and um, so in just five generations, it can grow from 0, almost 0, to 2,000. While um, if you look at the, for something that has R as 0.5, number of generations is um, it takes longer to get to the same amount and that's because it's uh, only 50% growth rate. Think of these as percentages in a sense. If r equals 0.5 then you get half the number of individuals growing each uh, being born each year. I remember with the starlings it was it was over one if uh, all the starlings were having five individuals born to them each year all the females did. Now, let's return to R max. We talked about R max being um, something where it, it's in perfect conditions. How, how much was the greatest amount of birth rate and the lowest amount of death rate? It really is a function of species life history traits. Some species naturally have many offspring and breed at a young age. Um, so the naturally many offspring, think of some, uh, something that has a lot of babies, you know, like a rabbit or a fly or something that's able to reproduce very quickly. They're often prey species that are expecting to get eaten pretty quickly. Um, so again, a fly, a rabbit. They breed at a very young age. They mature very quickly. They have a high R max. Um, they are able to, um, in optimal conditions, they will... Uh, put out tons of babies and they will put out and uh, they their death rate um, you know they live up to some number and and all of them the majority of them will live to that maximum age Um, fecundity is one thing. It describes the number of female offspring that can potentially uh, be produced by each female in a population. We talk, we talk about female offspring because um, the idea is that if, if there's even one male and the male is fertile, then uh, the number of babies that can be produced is more dependent on the number of females. If there's five females and one very fer fertile male, um, you know, then that matters more than, you know, five fertile males and one female because the female is the one producing. So which of these species would have a high fecundity? Now, if we were in the classroom together, then I would have, I would ask you guys to tell me, but I uh, will walk through each one of these here. Um, the sea turtle has, um, 
while it it uh, does grow to a reasonably old age um, and is very hardy once it's older, um, fecundity is rather high in the sea turtle um, because a lot of their babies are eaten by seagulls, sharks, a variety of predatory things, um, sometimes even crabs. So they lay a ton of eggs and all those eggs um, will hatch all at once and they scurry to the sea. But again, the expectation is that a lot of them are not going to make it past that first scurry to the sea. A lion, on the other hand, is very similar to ourselves. Um, they bear one to three children at a time, and um, they, they take care of those babies. It takes them a long time to have the babies, and um, it takes them a long time to mature sexually, similar to humans. Um, the next comparison would be between a, a, a pine tree and a coconut palm. The pine tree um, has tons of cones and tons of seeds in each cone and tons of things to eat those seeds. Uh, and they're very available to eat. Squirrels like to eat them. Um, lots of rodents, lots of um, foraging mammals and such. And it produces tons of them, so high fecundity but not all of them are going to grow into a big pine tree. Meanwhile, the uh, coconut palm will only produce one or two very hardy um, eh, coconut palms no, in comparison to a pine tree. They, they produce maybe 10 at a time of these coconuts, but they're large. They're hard to get into. They're hard to eat. Very few animals actually will commonly eat coconuts. It takes so much effort to break into them. Um, and so they invest a lot into the into these babies. Uh, the next thing that affects RMAX is survivorship. It describes the proportion of individuals in a, sp in a population that will survive to a specific age. Okay, so looking at these four species again, the um, the turtle itself actually has um, low survivorship for the babies, but recently higher survivorship um, as an adult. Um, and so more turtles will get to the, ol the oldest age that they can, then turtles won't make it past that first year. Um, that survivorship goes up in, um, in lions. Now, lions is interesting because uh, lions do live a while, you know, they live like 50 to 60 years. And um, not... Uh, fewer species, uh, fewer of the lions will make it to 50 or 60 years, to the oldest age they can get. But most of the babies will survive because, again, they protect them and they've invested a lot in them. Um, you can think of it as sim a similar way. If once the tree is grown um, for a palm or a um, pine tree, they will, um, they're stable and they'll survive to the oldest they can get to. Um, but uh, very few of the um, pine nuts, uh, the actual seeds, will make it to tree them, um, while more of the coconuts will. There's not as many of them, and they're more well protected. Um, so think of, uh, there's usually a trade-off. They're in inversely related. If something has invested its resources in the high fecundity, um, then uh, it probably hasn't invested all of its resources into making them really hardy and making them hard to kill and making them um, and taking care of them. A species has only so many resources to invest. So high fecundity is usually related to low survivorship, especially for the baby part. Um, when there's low fecundity, a um, you know there's generally high survivorship of the young, and uh, but low fecundity because all the resources instead of you know doing like 300 tiny babies that don't have a chance to survive they're doing three or four larger babies that they protect and that investment into protecting the babies either by putting a very thick husk around them or by raising them is what causes high survivorship but usually leads to low fecundity because you can't put you can't build that many strong intense babies um, and, uh, and have the resources to survive still. So, the deal is, is that even though all of these species have a different R max, at any one time a species will have a specific R. 
almost 100% of the time, with the exception of that um, Petri dish, dish example, where I shared that the Petri dish, um, it had uh, the perfect conditions for the, that bacteria. Very rarely will that be true in an ecosystem. We already talked about competition. We talked about um, consumption. Uh, we talked about resource limitation. And so almost 100 pretend that the R will be lower than the species R max, usually much lower. So why are these not maxed out constantly? Well, in large, uh, and again, this is, this is just showing the, the rats, you, they can produce very fast go from uh, zero to 500 individuals or you know five to 500 individuals very short period of time um, but they normally are not at that usually because they're lacking in some resources so this gets us to the complete equation again what I want you to understand from these equations is I'm not going to give it to you and be like here's some numbers plug them in and do all of the um, calculations what I want for you to understand is um, what causes the species patterns of, of survival and death to be the way they are? So the complete equation, instead of just looking at this change in, uh, in number over change in time equals the rate times the number, um, we have to put in another factor in. Okay, so uh, that is carrying capacity. The theoretical carrying capacity of the environment. So to remember K, I think carrying capacity but spelled with K's. If the population starts out as 500, and the K for that environment is 5,000, and R is 0.5, increasing 50% per year, the marginal rate of change, um, the, the expectation for this outcome, so we, we do the entirety of this uh, addition, normally you'd have um, a number that says, uh, for that rate of change, that in one year you'd have 250 individuals born. But if you take K into effect, if K is affecting how much can be born each year, then it will slow it down. You see that uh, 250 times 0.99, a little bit less than 250 will be born because the carrying capacity is beginning to put pressure on that individual population to slow its growth. So um, if the population started out at 5,000 um, or close to 5,000, then uh, the environment would put pressure on uh, that population to um, push it to basically decrease the fecundity or increase the death rate and create that intense, uh, that slowed population growth. And that's due to environmental and um, ecosystem scales pressure and we'll talk about what what those pressures are in just a minute so what is K in vault? Uh, K includes the resources in an area so how much food is available um, of course this de depends on the number of, of individuals there are um, water nutrients temperature uh, in that area like what are the actual intrinsic availability of things uh, of Species will do worse if there is limited resources. And also space, just space based on um, where they are. This uh, showed a picture of that strangler fig. The only reason why um, strangler fig isn't uh, all over the place is because they have to ex expend their energy to basically fight for space. And that limitation limits their um, fecundity, limits uh, their survivorship limits their ability to um, reach their R max. If you think of it in niche theory, which we talked about before, K is how much fundamental niche space is able to support a population. Um, this also includes species interactions too. Uh, K includes uh, diseases that might be uh, caused by having a very large density of population, consumers, uh, and uh, competition. Uh, that competition increases, you're uh, going to uh, clash more with other species if you have a higher number um, that will start to encroach in on someone else's niche. 
So different species use different strategies to maximize their reproductive success and their survivorship, given the challenges they're presented. Species are referred to as R-selected if their rate of growth is rapid. So think of R as the rate species. These ones, given any opportunity, they will just make tons of babies. Species are referred to as case selective. They slowly grow to the carrying capacity of the ecosystem and remain there for a long time. When we talked about the, uh, the um, we talked about in succession, uh, the, this climax community that's stable over time. Uh, the ones, the dominant species in the climax community, redwoods, elephants, other things like that, um, those are the case selected species. It may take them a little while to get there, but once they're there, they stay for a long time and they fill to the maximum um, space that that ecosystem will allow them to, but they don't go higher and they don't have an intense, fast growth rate. So we'll look through each one of these. Um, I created a model for each species so you can think about them this way. Um, our selected species, their motto is live fast, die young, make a ton of babies. Uh, the idea with this is that uh, these are normally prey species, these are weed species, these are things that um, their strategy is uh, overwhelm with numbers. Okay, so they mature quickly, they can basically immediately start making babies within a few weeks of being born. Um, high fecundity, they uh, are very fertile. Um, each individual is able to produce tons and tons of babies, but they don't care for their babies babies. Uh, the effort has gone into making tons of babies and then they usually abandon them when they're very young and the, the young mature very quickly as well. Um, a short lifespan. You know, if you're talking about mice and rats. They make great pets. I used to have some. Uh, but those mice and rats were actually, at, they actually had a, have a very short lifespan. They burn out quick. Um, use all their resources up. Very fast individuals. They have a high RMAX. Again, um, they, this is one with uh, low survivorship, um, high fecundity. Poor competitors. Um, their competition strategy is numbers, but uh, they can get run out of the numbers game pretty, pretty quickly. Um, they aren't able to compete for hard to reach resources. Uh, and high survivorship to the low, oldest age, because their oldest age is not very old, and low survivorship in babies though. The idea is that their babies do not survive to um, adulthood. Uh, very few are expected to actually and this is because um, of it's a numbers game really. So if something is has stopped eating their young or they're able to outpace whatever's eating them that's their strategy to survive. The case selected their motto is slow and steady wins the race. They mature slowly. They have a low fecundity. Um, so they don't actually um, have that many babies even when uh, they've matured to do it. You know, it takes us uh, 14 to 16 years to get to, um, for the female to reach um, sexual maturity and to carry a baby. Um, and in that slow maturity, you know, uh, cared for by the parents. So think of... Um, for case-selected animals, uh, normally the parents will put a lot of resources into creating one or two babies and then take care of them and protect them to adulthood. Similar to what we do, right? Uh, long lifespan. Long, uh, you know, it, it depends on what you mean by long. The long versus short lifespan in plants depends. You know, got animals versus perennials. Some of them are even longer, but uh, something like an old growth redwood can uh, live hundreds of years while your average um, deciduous tree will live to be maybe 100 total. And that's a shorter lifespan than the climax community ones. They're very com good competitors. Again, they're slow. Slow and steady wins the race. Eventually they will push out everything. This is the process of succession. When you have that secondary succession and uh, maybe the redwood forest is coming back from a fire, um, the fast species will take over at first. But then the slower, more steady, more R-selected species will take over after that and push the fast but weak competitors out. So again, low survivorship in oldest age. 
once they, uh, and that's because the oldest age tends to be pretty old, um, but high and youngest because they're being taken care of by a group. These are often, um, or um, in the case of redwoods, uh, they are producing these very hardy seeds that will last like 100 years in the soil, waiting for their opportunity to come out. All right, so an example exam question that you might see is most prey species are blank selected. Most predator species are blank selected. So if you think about it that way, if you think that one of these types of selected species is expecting their babies to be eaten, okay, that's the one that's producing tons of babies but not taking care of them, and that would be the R selected. Most predator species are going to be case selected. And again, that case selected sense is that um, the uh, predators, nothing's eating them. They can afford to be slower and uh, take care of their young and uh, put more resources into protecting their young. Um, and then a uh, thought question. So our humans are case selected. So you might say are, I mean, we're pretty fertile. But uh, we have a lot of case selected strategies here. Um, but our crops are case selected. So that's an interesting question because actually crops, most of them used to be case selected. Uh, perennial species that lasted year after year that were very hardy. Um, and they would slowly produce uh, very nutrient dense uh, food. But humans wouldn't have that because we, we want to have consistent food production every year. So through breeding, we've actually changed a lot of, especially the grain crops from um, K selected to R selected so that we can have um, yearly crops instead of uh, having like a little bit more this year, a little bit less this year because they're weathering storms and whatnot. So um, that tended to be how the um, perennial grains would work. So this is just another um, example of a R versus K selected um, plant. Uh, the R selected is annual growing, tons of different babies, a very wide dispersal, trying to get anywhere that they can grow, they will, um, but very small percentage of the babies actually survive to uh, adulthood to reproduce. While the K selected species are going to put a lot of energy into hardy acorns or like the oak tree. Um, that lasts a long time and, uh, you know, will be slowly distributed over a large area of space. So think of it this way, the K species tend to, uh, they will have an exponential phase and reach a, a plateau, while our species tend to have the, what's called these boom and bust cycles. Okay, we're going to talk about that next. So the question, what happens when the rate of growth of a population does not change? Think of it this way. We start with a population of 100. So it doesn't change in response to K is what I mean. So let's start with 100 individuals. If you maintain a rate of increase of 20%, no matter, remember, uh, the K uh, calculation usually means that uh, the environment pushes back and reduces this rate over time. But if, what if you just maintain a rate of increase? Each year, each generation, you're going to multiply the current population size, which will be growing, by the rate of increase, which is not decreasing over time. intensity 
here. Okay, so in nature, exponential growth is observed in two circumstances. A few individuals found a new population in a new habitat. Or a population is devastated by a storm or some other catastrophe and begins to recover, starting with a few surviving individuals. So uh, imagine a, a small population uh, like when um, Europeans came to the New World. They saw this endless frontier able to expand hugely into um, the next expand uh, hugely like there's no limit here this seems open giant coming to the US is amazing um, you know the, the tribes that were here were even very spread out they were like they're not even utilizing most of these things but once we started to fill the US we saw actually there are environmental pressures that are limiting how many people can live in different areas um, uh, exponential growth is also seen, again, in uh, K or R species if there's some cat a catastrophe. And this a uh, few surviving individuals actually um, start recovering. It's not actually possible for exponential growth to continue indefinitely. Um, so when you're thinking about what causes a factor uh, to influence population, you can, we talked about when a population is density dependent or independent. Um, but factors in an ecosystem that influence a population, regardless of how big the population is, are considered density independent. So this is a picture of here are these mice. Um, there's a low density of them, and there's a stream running through their habitat. The stream, when they try to cross it, uh, kills a lot of the mice. So even if there were a ton of mice, that stream would still exist, and it would still affect the mice, uh, no matter how many mice there are, the stream is still there and it's still affecting them. Um, and it will affect them whether there's a few or a lot. So, for instance, no matter how robust the population is, a lava flow will kill them off. Or a fire affects everything the same. It's not going to affect a um, less dense forest more than a more dense forest if there's um, enough stuff to burn on the ground. Factors that influence the population based on how big the population is is considered density dependent. Uh, so this would be something like a, uh, a low density of mice. Um, there's very few predators in that area because there's just not many mice to eat. And uh, they can find more places to hide. Uh, but if there's a ton of them, suddenly it's obvious to the predators, hey, there's a bunch of mice there and the predators will start to come and their predator uh, population will increase as well. So that's density dependent. If, if it changes, how that, uh, if predation changes as, um, as individuals um, grow and uh, increase in density, then uh, that is a density dependent thing. So we're not in the classroom right now. But we're going to talk through density dependent and density independent factors. So if you pretend that our classroom is a habitat, which of these factors would be density dependent or density independent? Okay, so um, let's pretend that something like uh, a disaster of some sort is happening. Which of these things, if a disaster happened to them, would... Uh, be dependent or in independent. So we'll walk through each one. Okay, so uh, for instance, heat from heating ducts. What if the heat shut off? Would it matter if there was five people in a classroom or 50 people? Now someone mentioned in one of my other classes that it wouldn't, uh, it's slightly density dependent because a classroom full of 50 people would feel the heat uh, going off as less than the people, than someone in a five there. But the thing is, is that the heat going off would still affect the entire population. And it would not uh, matter if there was five or 50, the heat going off would go off in the same way. Similarly, if we had a power outage and the lights went off, it wouldn't matter how many people were there. The lights going off would affect all of us, um, even if there was uh, the maximum number of people in the uh, classroom. Um, the amount of oxygen available for each person would also, um, so 
if suddenly the room became sealed and there was 45 people in there and there's a finite amount of oxygen, the number of people absolutely does matter. It starts to matter when, uh, if there's something consuming it, think of it as um, if more individuals are going to use more of that resource, if that resource becomes limited, suddenly that's a density de uh, dependent thing. Uh, food is a similar way. I used the example of a zombie apocalypse. What if a zombie apocalypse happened and this was the only floor available for us to access? So let's pretend we're in 209. Uh, there's a vending machine down the hall. But if there were five people, we'd be able to sustain ourselves on the vending machine until the zombies moved off, uh, moved away versus if they, um, if they did not move away for a while and there was 50 people, we'd run out of snacks and water pretty quickly. Another one that is uh, density dependent on a regular basis is disease, particularly infectious disease. Okay, so for instance, the flu. Um, so the flu will cause, uh, if one person has a flu and there's only five people in the room, those other four people are not very likely to get the flu because they're less likely to um, be close enough to that other person to catch that flu. But if, um, think of it this way, if like 5% of the uh, population has it, if the population grows and 5% has it, that's more individuals who have the flu, and you're more likely to encounter a flu-containing person because of the density of that population. So going to a crowded mall, you're more likely to get the flu than if you go if you hang out just with your own family because uh, that's a density dependent factor. Finally, living space, obviously, it's a density dependent. There's more living space if there's less people, less if there's more. So density dependent factors, again, food shortages, overcrowding the seats issue. Uh, predation, predation tends to increase when there's more individuals. So um, uh, bears will go and seek out salmon runs where there's a high density of prey to choose from. And disease uh, more likely affects uh, crowded areas than um, uncrowded because it can pass from person to person or individual to individual very quickly. Density dependent effects after exponential growth can be dramatic. So if you look in the top, uh, this is a case study of the um, 2004 locust swarm in Africa. If you look up in the top right corner, um, you have, uh, you'll see that April 6th to 13th, um, the colors on the map represent the anomaly in vegetation growth. Randomly, in this area that's reasonably dry normally, uh, there was a huge, huge amount of intense uh, growth, and that was just due to um, a lot of storms at the right time. And so there was a huge uh, boom of vegetation, which meant that the locusts, who normally are laying their eggs around this time, had plenty of food, and were able to lay more eggs than usual. Um, and uh, so their fecundity was increased suddenly because the resources were increased. Um, then once uh, the eggs hatched, uh, all of the stuff in that northern area had dried out and they moved south. And when I say they, I mean millions and millions and millions of locusts that had uh, hatched. And there wasn't enough food for them. Because again, this is a density dependent effect. There wasn't enough food and they devastated entire countries. Um, these swarms ate forests, they destroyed crops, they destroyed people's livelihoods. Um, you can see in the bottom map that gray area, all those gray areas and those brown areas, that's where the locusts ate everything. The problem is, is that there were so many of them that they ate themselves, uh, they, they ate as much as they could, but there still wasn't enough per individual. And they died off and didn't even reproduce. So you have this gigantic swarm of locusts and then it goes away and like, you know, it takes until 50 years later for them to build up their population again. And these are, this is a boom and bust cycle in, in like intensity here. Um, again, these boom and bust cycles result from exponential growth. Some uh, animals actually have these on a regular basis. Uh, the snowshoe hare and the lynx, if the snowshoe hare has a good year and spikes in population, well, the lynx 
sees that spike and uh, is able to produce more babies that, um, that the year that that's spiking. And then when the snowshoe population crashes because there's not enough food for them and then the lynx population crashes because there's not enough food for them and then the spike happens and then the crash happens and this happens a lot with predator prey relationships. So logistic population occurs when growth rate of population slows as resources become limited. That, that carrying capacity factor that I showed you before in that complete equation. Um, the maximum number that can be supported by that habitat without depleting resources is the carrying capacity. So exponential growth usually launches it past the carrying capacity. Logistic growth slows as it reaches and stabilizes. The environmental resistance int intensifies, as I showed you with those um, locusts. There just wasn't enough food, and once they exhausted all the food, they exhausted their ability to, um, they didn't have any place to, pl to lay their eggs, and they all died off very suddenly. Um, and often what will happen is that uh, a, a species will overshoot slightly and then crash a little and then overshoot slightly and crash. So that would be similar to the hare and lynx population there. Neither one of them is, um, is, has huge exponential growth, but they do have these little spikes and wobbles. Um, and they're often delayed um, in organisms with extended lifetimes, and they can be delayed in ones that aren't too. Uh, for instance, the younger, um, younger locusts, they don't require as much uh, food as the older ones do. And if the older ones are delayed, um, if there's a ton of older ones, then you need different resources. So imagine a, uh, we're going to talk about this next week, a population of uh, people very uh, dense in kids and um, very low in adults. Will there be enough space for all of those individual kids to have their own homes, to have their own jobs, etc.? Imagine what happens when all of them get to adulthood. And we'll talk about some of those uh, effects next week. And this response can be excessively delayed until almost the end of a, of a life cycle, and then suddenly that crash happens again. Um, what if all the older people eat up everything the younger people need? You know, sustainability issues here. So population crash that we talked about before. All right, so just another example that where you use the two different equations that we saw. So coming back to um, people for a minute. Um, so here is the uh, what happened in human population from 10,000 BCE to now. We are in a period of exponential growth. Question is, what kind of growth curve does the global human population follow? One of the issues is that we don't know what the carrying capacity of Earth is, and we don't know well, we don't know exactly what's going to make a population slow, the global population slow. Um, so the hope would be that we're in our exponential phase and then we're going to level out and go in that logistic curve and become a stable population. But if we start spiking past the carrying capacity of the Earth, well, we may be headed for a population crash if we're not careful about how we use the resources. If we eat up all the resources that uh, younger generations need, then we may have one of those delayed response things that causes a huge crash, and we obviously don't want that. So think about the things that have allowed human population growth to continue to increase, and think about, well, what would happen if any of these were taken away? Um, so it's medical care, it's um, the ability to fight disease using medicine, uh, and uh, um, the moderation of um, population by um, birth control and such. But it's complicated. We're gonna, again, we're going to get into this next week. So what is the carrying capacity of Earth? And I'll end on this. Uh, some scientists think it's somewhere around 10 billion. We've grown from 6 to 7 billion in just the last few years. Um, we expect to reach at least 10 billion by 2050, so within our lifetimes. Um, if 10 billion is the carrying capacity of Earth, 
what happens then? Where do we go from there? Will our population actually slow down or will we spike past it and have to deal with the fallout of not being able to have capacity to support these people? All right, thank you so much for listening. Um, again, I'm going to post a assignment about this and uh, you'll be able to um, create a comment to get participation points. Thank you. Have a fantastic weekend.